So today, tonight we're really talking about what happens, what to do when you first receive a diagnosis that your child might have autism or another developmental disorder and kind of now what? Um, and that's one of our challenges. So some of the research projects I work on, we get to work with families and think through with them what the best strategies they found when they first received diagnosis and to work with people who are helping families um, engage in services, so I'm going to borrow from their um, thoughts and findings and talk to you a little bit about what we think might be some good first steps. So it might be a little bit overwhelming to first get a diagnosis and have a million recommendations come at you. Um, I know uh, a lot of parents think that there's just so much information it's really unclear where to start. So tonight we really just want to talk about what are those first steps that we want to take because I think taking this in a um, stepwise fashion is really the way to go. But I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the steps to take, but they kind of focus on this. So the first one is just keep on parenting. That child you left that diagnostic evaluation with is the same child you came in with, and you've been doing an awesome job parenting that child up until now, and you can keep doing that. All those things you're doing, the way you know your child, the, the way you've been as a parent, all those things still work still happen are still important. All that love and support is still your family. And so I think that's one of the most important things to think about. We'll talk about getting support, um, support from family, support from friends, and choosing the people who are gonna give you the right kind of support that is really helpful to you. What kind of support do you need? Um, and thinking about that. And then educating yourself and getting involved, which I'll, I'll talk way too much about. So first thing, educating yourself. Um, this is important because you want to know what you need to know. Um, so where do you start, right? If we put autism into Google, that is confusing because there are going to be 10,000 websites, some which will be helpful and some which will not. So probably you left whatever place you left with um, information about your child's diagnosis or program where someone provided you a list of recommendations of next steps. That's where I would start educating myself. So maybe it says speech therapy or occupational therapy on there. Look that up. What does a speech therapist do? What does an occupational therapist do? Maybe it says early intervention. What's the early intervention system in my community? Those are the places to start. There's lots of information to learn. But what your child needs right now is on that little list. So start at number one and, and educate yourself about that piece of it because there will be time to learn the rest. And as you learn more, you'll find people to help guide you to where the good information is. Now this information I'm giving you is really general because every one of your children is really different and probably if you live across the street from someone, your service system is different. So that's where the education is really important because our system of care here is different depending on where you live, what school district you're in, uh, what insurance company you have, and so that education is really important. Get good information. Again, you've got that Google search that brings you 10,000 things and some of them are really expensive and may or may not work. So here are some places where I think you can start to get some really good information. So the Mind Institute, shocking. Um, we have a great resource center and a wonderful website that can lead you to some other good websites to find good information about systems, about evidence-based practices. Um, you probably have a family resource center in your neighborhood if you live in California. Um, in Sacramento, that is Warmline, YOLO, it's Family Soup. There is a place where you can get great information and talk to a human, human person that's also a parent who can help walk you through where to start next and provide you good information. The National Provel Professional Development Center for Autism has a list of evidence-based practices and descriptions of those. If you think that you want to learn more about a particular practice, that's a great place to go. 
Similarly, the Autism Speaks website has videos of different children at different stages who have autism, different practices you could learn about. You can actually watch people doing the interventions. And so that's a nice place to look. And you know on these sites the information is reliable. This is not an exhaustive list. These are some examples. But be careful when you're looking around and really make sure that the information that you're getting is reliable because there's just a lot out there. Expect high quality. So one of the challenges, I think, is that now you need to go and find intervention for your child, either at school or at home or in a therapy center. And so these are a few things that I think you can look for or ask about when you are starting those interventions. So define procedures. Do they have a thing that they're doing? Um, and do they have sort of procedures for doing that, especially if they indicate they're using a particular evidence-based practice? Really, where are the procedures for that and how did you learn those? It's okay to ask those questions. Are they willing and are they proactive at individualizing whatever intervention it is to your child and family? So remember, you're the expert on your child and you're getting education, but you're also educating your team. And so they're gonna develop these clearly defined treatment goals, because if they don't, that's gonna be a clue about the quality of the program. But you're a part of that development. The goals need to fit with your family and your child, and you're the expert on that. And I think that's a really important piece. Um, and if somebody is setting up an intervention program without understanding or assessing where your child is and where your family is, that's a challenge. They should be tracking progress too. So if we've got these clearly defined goals that you've developed with your team, fabulous. How do we know if the treatment's working? Well, with autism, we don't have a good understanding of matching a child's characteristics to a particular treatment ahead of time. We just haven't found a good way to do it. Kids are really different and gosh darn it, we try to predict and they trick me every time. So the research really says the way we know if a treatment's working is we see if it's working. And that tells us when to change things, right? So you want a program that's tracking whether your child is making progress toward these goals. And so you can make changes if they're not making progress. Or if they're making progress super quickly, you can add new goals. And any program that's of high quality should be able to do that. And then you want to make sure that they've got good staff training and ongoing support. So oftentimes, especially with in-home programs that are really high intensity, they're very young people providing intervention. That's great, they're enthusiastic, they know how to play with kids, and they can be super fun. But they also need, and good, so, um, but they need some support around the training, making sure they're doing the intervention correctly, and the, having the support they need when things need to change. And so those are questions I think that you can ask any intervention provider to help understand if these are high quality. School providers, home providers, therapists, any of that. And we've got good providers, so you can expect that. So this is an important one, because I feel that right when you get a diagnosis, there's a lot of talk about urgency of getting an intervention. We've got to start right away. And if we don't start right away, ah, what's going to happen? And you know, we want to start quickly. I'm not telling you to kind of, you know, wait a few years or months or whatever. You want to start moving through the process, getting your child into programs. But it's not that if they start today versus a week or two or even a month from now, that's okay. Take the time to think about, is this program right for my family? What intensity is right for my family? What do we need? What does my child need? You have the time to think about it. If you've run across a program where someone tells you, sort of like at the gym when you have a trial membership and they say, if you leave today without signing up, it's never going to be this cheap, right? If you don't start my program this week, then your child will not get over this or whatever. That's a sign that there's a challenge there, right? So take the time to really think through these things as you're, as you're um, figuring them out and kind of ease your panic. I say that knowing you can't really ease your panic, but I'm gonna say it to help you breathe a little. <laughs> it's like, sleep, don't have a nightmare. Know your rights, this gives you a lot of power. So there are a lot of rules and regulations about how long an agency has to 
um, get you in for an evaluation or how long they have between the evaluation and when service starts, what your rights are to be involved in developing goals and things like that. And what the information they're going to hand you is looks a lot like the iTunes agreement I just clicked through on my when I updated my phone. Uh, it is information that no human should read or understand. But luckily, those websites I talked to you about, the Family Resource Center, the Mind Institute, there are um, nice handouts with information about your key rights that kind of distill that in a way that a human can understand. So I'd encourage you, depending on the service system you're in, early intervention, education, developmental services, to really understand what your rights are um, not to be argumentative in any way, but to know what you have a right to ask for and to know how to stand up for what your child needs. Because um, you've got a lot of rights and we should take advantage of those, I think. And then get involved. Remember, you are the expert about your child and family. You know your child better than anyone. So we've got a lot of people probably doing assessments and setting up treatment plans and being doctors. And really, they need your input. And so please don't be afraid to speak up, to ask questions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Really, they need you to make the program good. And they know that. And hopefully, they're going to ask the questions. But if they don't, please speak up. So getting involved can be really different for different people, right? Some people have two jobs and volunteering all day in school is, is not going to happen, <laughs> right? Um, even making it to an IEP meeting be, may be a challenge or, or a, a school meeting. Um, so think about the level at which you can be involved. Maybe it's sending a note back and forth to school in your child's backpack to know how things went or to tell the teacher he didn't sleep well last night or this great thing happened, let's try it at school. Um, maybe it's setting up a 15-minute phone check-in with an intervention provider once a month or once a quarter. Maybe it is volunteering at school or learning intervention strategies yourself to try at home. There are lots of ways to be involved. I'd really like to encourage you to find the ways that work the best for your family. There is a great deal of research saying that if you're involved, that is better for you in terms of your stress level. It's better for your child. It's better for your teachers and interventionists because everyone's really working together. Sometimes parents are the communication glue that holds that treatment team together just by letting people know what other people are doing. Um, and that relationship that you can build, even if it's through notes or phone calls or emails, um, with your child's provider lets you know when something is coming up or something you need to address. It won't feel like the first time you're talking to them. So what are some strategies for working together? And I've given this talk to parents and the same talk the other way to providers. So I know we have some providers in, um, in this audience too, and so I think all these strategies work well both directions. Um, but for parents, especially building your own confidence in the process, every time going in saying, I'm the one who knows my child and family best. That's really important. I now know my rights, I know what the service is, and I know my child. I can have the expectation that this school, this early intervention agency, this provider has my child and my best interests at heart, and I hope that's the way this goes. But I know what high quality is, and I know what my child needs, so I can chime in when I need to. Know what you want for your child. What are your goals? Again, whatever goals you're setting up, you want to do it together. So you really want to know where do you want your child to be next <laughs> month, next year, down the line. So you can communicate that with the provider so that the road that they're taking with their goals matches yours. Speak up. Both directions, right? You, uh, it, no one knows if you have a concern or if you have a joy or if you have something to share unless you say so. And so really remember to do that. Um, a lot of times I think we see the school or the doctor as the expert. And again, I'm going to say it a hundred times. You are the expert on your child and family. Tell them your concerns, your ideas, um, everything. So how can we ask questions in a way that we're heard? I think this is important, again, both directions. Try starting with one question and see how it goes. Is this a person who takes my questions well, or do I need to figure out a new way to come at this? Make sure you leave time. So coming at a teacher at the beginning of the day when everybody's coming in may not be a time for that teacher to be able to ask a question. Or maybe you have an hour-long 
therapy session at speech therapy and you're there, maybe we need to ask the provider to leave some time at the end to let her know or him know that you have questions. Make that time. Write your questions down. I don't know about you, but I have to write my questions down when I go to the doctor because I get all flabbergasted when I get in there or confused or misdirected. So writing them down is really important. And then if you're having a challenge finding the time, schedule a time. Can I email these questions to you? Can I leave you these questions here written and we exchange via the backpack or whatever? Reframe how you ask the question. So think about how you'd feel if you were asked the question and how that person might feel as you're asking the question. So a parent might say, why don't you use such and such approach? And the provider, depending on their skill and confidence level, might think, you don't know about much as the therapist we used to see. That's why you're not using it. So you might ask something like, how can we decide which approach is best for my child? Right? Just thinking about a way to ask that that provider will be a little ready to listen. If I do what you say, will my daughter talk soon? The provider might be hearing, can you guarantee that this is going to work? Right? Maybe a nicer way to ask or a different way to ask, what steps do I need to take to help my daughter communicate better? So you're still getting at it. You might even get a timeline in there, right? The same answer, but hopefully a little um, less defensiveness from that provider. <coughs> Be sure to ask for what you need. There are lots of things that go with your rights. You can look at any documents, assessments. If you need a translator or an interpreter, really important. If you can't get to a meeting because you don't have transportation, ask. There is help for these kinds of things. If there's a better way for the team to communicate with you, you need things written down, you need things by phone, you need to meet in person, you need a special time to meet, ask for the things that you need. Show positive regard, super simple. If a provider or an agency does something you like or agree with, just say so. Because then when they're doing something that's not so agreeable, you, you've got some relationship there so that they know that you're not just looking for the things that are a challenge, which can be really hard in the beginning, right? Because we're trying to get the best. It's hard to notice the good things, just like you know, with your child or your spouse, right? It's always good to point out where there's common areas. Showing that you're listening, really important. Think about it both directions, right? We feel better when we're listened to. Try to listen. Be as organized as you can. There are, at the Family Resource Center, some sort of how to organize the materials you need. There are a lot of materials that come to you and at you. And if you can have a place for them so that you can put your hand on them when you need them, it will be really helpful for your providers. Um, and you'll look super organized, and they'll be like, oh, this parent's on the ball. It makes a difference. Yeah. So key things that I hope that you'll take from my piece of the presentation, because you're going to hear some really awesome things soon. You can advocate for your child and be an active part of the treatment team, and your involvement is important at whatever level you're able to provide. You have the knowledge and under your understanding that is needed for your child's treatment, and also you can get the support you need to get that information. So just ask for it. It, it, it will, you'll feel better, they'll feel better, and just take this one step at a time. It's a lot of information, so start with that initial list, one step at a time. All right, so next we're gonna hear from the real experts who have been through this. So thank you so much, Abin, and good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Um, so my objective today in my, for my short time with you is to basically talk to you a little bit um, about the process of navigating an autism diagnosis. And um, I will, of course, be coming from the lens that I have, which is to, of being a former educator, um, uh, being a advocate um, and also a researcher, but I think the the lens that I bring that really I identify more strongly than any other would be being a parent of a child with autism. So the picture you have here um, is my son and my daughter. I have two beautiful children, and I uh, this is of course a baby picture of him. Um, but I'm going to lead with a little bit of a background uh, to tell you a little bit about how um, our journey with autism began. So at 
four, at, at two years, four months of age on November 9th, 2010, uh, my son was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And I can tell you, I remember every detail of that day. I remember the clean smell of the lobby when I came in to uh, the clinician's office. I remember the sounds of the leather couch, of what it made when I sat down to talk to the child psychologist. And I remember even how I wore my hair that day. <laughs> the very tight, slicked back, clean professional bun with bobby pins to secure it. <laughs> I also remember how I felt after the diagnosis. Very insecure, very uncertain as what to, was going to come next. And I can remember thinking, how did this happen? What did I do? I was devastated, but that was my beginning. Today, this precious baby is now nine years old. He is in third grade. He has acted in two, in two separate plays, in plays on his elementary school band in the, as the snare drum. He's a drummer and very proud of it. Um, he has friends. And between you and I, don't say anything, I think he has his first crush. <laughs> Um, he has been included, fully included, with typical peers, neurotypical peers, uh, for all of his academic career. And I cannot forget to say that he is one of the funniest people I have ever met in my life, and truly a joy uh, to be around. So that is my present. I am very accepting of him. I'm very accepting of what it means to have a child with autism, with autism and being a parent, uh, that gives me a sense of pride. But that's my today. But what you just have heard are two separate stories, right? Those are the bookends of, the, of, of my experience. And really, if you think about it, it's the same person, same child, but two different ideas, dispositions, attitudes when it came to autism and when it came to the, uh, the idea of what this journey would look like. I call that the middle stage of really thinking about what's happening in the middle uh, that really makes the difference, not the present or the, the beginning. So today really we're gonna talk more about that middle, that seven year gap that happened between then and now, because I believe that that part of the journey will truly help us understand how to support parents who have children with autism. And I will also share with you a few stories of a research project that we have uh, here, from a research project that we have going on here at the MIND Institute that is in collaboration with three other institutions, UCLA, Penn, and University of Rochester, where we conducted parent focus groups for, uh, to really talk to parents um, about what it was like uh, to receive a diagnosis and what are some of the challenges and barriers to receiving services. Um, this occurred uh, where within the last two years where we in, interviewed over 60 parents and 50 providers and, and, and held over 37 fo focus groups. And the name of that particular project is the Air B Mind the Gap project. So my middle experience was filled with a monsoon of various feelings, pressures, and newfound supports and allies. I now have the privilege of working with dozens of families, and I can attest that there are many emotions that take place in a family's life when it comes to getting this diagnosis. And this list is just a few of some of the emotions that can surface. And honestly, uh, when we're looking at this list, um, even today, these, mo these emotions will still erupt from time to time, the unpleasant emotions. But I'm happy to say I, I definitely live a lot more in that acceptance today than I did before. But in working with families, and also can give you a personal account, one that comes very commonly is guilt. 
So a study in 2006 uh, that followed 170 mothers with children who had an autism diagnosis for seven years after the diagnosis, to me uh, they measured how guilt, knowledge of ASD or autism, and maternal agency were related to maternal self-efficacy. They found that uh, there was a negative correlation with self-efficacy and maternal agency, and there was a po positive correlation uh, with, self with, with maternal agency and self-efficacy. Um, so guilt, in other words, when mothers had, were more guilty, feel, feeling more guilty, there was a common association um, with feeling that they were not able to be able to really help their child. Whereas when mothers felt more confident in their parenting abilities and less guilt, uh, they felt like they had more agency to be able to really help their child. So most seasoned parents will attest that um, experiencing really every single one of these emotions is quite regular and is not uncommon. Um, and unlike the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, cycles of loss that many of you might, be a, might know, um, having a child with a disability is not, the emotions that come are really, it doesn't follow a logical or linear process. Um, in fact, one moment you can be in the realm of acceptance and feel very confident about your parenting, but then sudden, a sudden new stereotypic behavior erupts <laughs> or uh, some kind of regression to a skill, a communication or a socialization uh, goal that you've been working on for a really long time comes and there you are back into that sea of confusion. And so I'm actually going to be uh, referencing from time to time and using, when we're talking about sea of confusion, the images, the visual images of water and land to really uh, give you a metaphor of what I would say would be the best translation of what it's like after diagnosis in that middle time of, of navigating a diagnosis. So right after a diagnosis, families feel like they are thrusted into a middle, many, it can be very common that families feel like they're thrust into the middle of the ocean in a small raft, <laughs> feeling very lonely, confused, and life is so much more eff effortful. To read two responses from the parents who participated in the Mind the Gap focus group um, that attested to their feelings, one reads, um, in my case, in the beginning, I didn't have the support from anyone, um, and it kind of shut me down and even, from even wanting to get help for my daughter. Another read, so I just had this diagnosis, but I didn't know what to do next. So I figured out the next steps. It took me more than a year because I had no d direction to go. Feelings of hopelessness can be intensified with what I call waves of internal and external pressures. So these external waves include things like the fact that now you have complete strangers that are coming into your home <laughs> uh, that will be working with your child on a daily basis. Uh, the frequent occurrence of therapist turnover, new people coming in and out uh, of your life and getting acquainted to that. Other external pressures, so these are things that are out of your immediate influence of control, are lack of predictability from year to year when it comes to schooling placement, teachers, uh, where, your, what chi where your child will even be uh, the, from year to year, depending on where the school district is saying their class will be held. And of course, social attitudes and uh, current leadership also can dictate uh, how your experience will be impacted, and social stigma. So how others perceive disability, and specifically autism, so how their ideas about what autism means directly impacts the way that they interact with your child and the way that they interact with you. These are just a few of external waves that can come and, and really cause a lot of pressure in a family's life during this middle time. But internal markers and of wave makers could include marriage instability. I tell people all the time that 
There is a reason why the divorce rate is very high in the autism community for families when they get recent diagnosis. It's because you have two people that most likely, of course, love a child very much and want to be able to do whatever they can to help, but they're hurting. And they're both in the middle of that sea, the middle of that ocean, trying to stay afloat. And it's really hard to help someone when you yourself needs help also. So that can be a big pressure. Hostile work environments can also be a pressure. When family, it's very common for families, uh, if they have a two-parent household, that one parent will have to uh, resume the responsibility of being the manager of uh, their child's intervention. So that's their full-time job. Um, and so the household will dramatically change, and the work environment, therefore, is impacted. And, of course, that impacts financial stressors. And what about the siblings? I talked to you a little bit about my daughter. You saw the picture of my daughter. We experienced that. What happens when there's a developmental storm in, in the sibling's life that you need to be able to pay attention to, right? That can cause a storm, a wave to come. And then, of course, for many of, of us, we forget about physical and mental health. What happens when we forget to take care of ourselves, and as a result, there's a wave that comes uh, that happens that we need to pay attention to because of our physical health? And of course, I've already mentioned the wave of guilt that surfaces over and over again. So any of these waves can make it hard for parents to know how to navigate after a time of diagnosis. And some of them, honestly, are inevitable. They will come and they will happen. But for me, what I found was the best way to be able to really uh, get through them was to look for land. This was finding ways to find allies, supports, many of those that Aubin talked about earlier, finding good, credible information to go to so that I can be able to feel a little bit more secure um, in my journey. And the truth is that all of these pressures are really hard, and, and emotions are really hard to overcome. But I'm gonna give you a proverb that my grandmother used to say that I would hope that it would give you a little bit, give, encourage you a little bit more as it always did for me. She would tell me, baby, Trouble don't last always. Meaning that the chaotic experience that you might be feeling in this middle time of navigating this diagnosis, there's hope. It will, will not always be that way. And that with help, you will be able to find land. So I have found that there are many helpers uh, when, it can't, when it comes to in, uh, many ways to be able to find that stability. Um, and also in our study, uh, the Airb Mind the Gap study, we found that there are some themes when it comes to uh, helpers, things that can facilitate uh, families in uh, really achieving some um, equilibrium. And some of them include a strong parent-provider partnership, uh, also having providers that really go over and beyond in supporting families and using their influence and their positions to do some of that invisible work, that behind the scenes work, to really pave the way for families, especially if they know that you know, this parent really is in need of some, some additional nudging or support. Uh, parent peer supports, parent support groups. I have been blessed to have amazing parents that I have been in. Uh, community with as a result of having a child with autism. We share this journey together. It's not me alone, it's us together. Cultural brokers can be an amazing uh, helper when it comes to helping families, in particular for families who are from historically marginalized communities. Having someone to really take the information that's there and help translate it, make it meaningful for communities that are not getting this very important information. And also, I have found in my experience that gaining that maternal self-agency as for mothers, but then also coming to that place of acceptance of your child is absolutely a stabilizer. 
So I'm going to read to you a few of these excerpts um, from our study uh, when it comes to uh, resources and supports that families have, have found um, in this middle time. It run reads, so when I saw their willingness to tell me certain things that I, then I just put my guard down. And that's when I was okay and I let everything go. I humbled myself. Then I could be open. I was ready to be taught. And so they showed me things and they opened up a whole new world for me. Another reads, so I think that this was probably my saving grace and the success of my child really was from being involved with a support group who had been there to help me out. So there are still seasons of instability and there are still waves of chaos in my and my family's life. But I'm no longer on that raft and I'm no longer in the middle of the ocean. I have my own little small island of hope and acceptance. Much like this illustration of a, a bunch, a group of interconnected islands called an archipelago, I have now found a network of individuals in my autism community, my families, my wider disability family uh, community, uh, with allies of therapists and providers, uh, with people that understand the importance of inclusion and acceptance that now I know that I'm not on my own. And nothing helps get me through that middle, and I hope will help get you through the middle more than knowing that you have a child that you love, loves you, and they know that they are completely accepted, and you have a relationship that will surpass any of these waves. So I thank you for your time, and now I'm going to turn it over to my very capable colleague, Kathy. So I came to the Mind Institute a few years ago bringing a blend of professional skills in the world of advocacy for families of children with disabilities and the importance of special education and that realm with the wisdom of being a parent. And this is my beautiful daughter, Megan, who is now 35 years old, for some of you who have known me a long time in this room. And so before I tell you a little bit about the project that my colleague Erin and I are working on to support families here at The Mind, I feel the need to just tell you a little bit about my experience as a parent. So my daughter, Megan, was born in 1982 and she has cerebral palsy. So I am not up here trying to say that I understand completely what it is like to get a diagnosis of autism, but I know what it's like to get a diagnosis. My daughter spent 21 days, the first 21 days of her life in an intensive care unit. And that was where our journey began. And my husband and I, just knew that we were on this journey together, so it's always good to know where your just immediate support is. But we realized right away that those dreams that we had required some change. So we knew in order to navigate those systems of care, we would build new dreams that were not necessarily based on a medical model in 1982, or not a grief model that people gave us lots of articles to read about, but we knew that we wanted a life for Megan that would come with finding the right adaptations and the right accommodations to give her an opportunity for her childhood. That was what resonated with me each and every day. What can I do as a mother so that my child will still have the opportunity to, as, to experience childhood and have an inclusive life? So when I look at how the journey starts and where the journey continues 35 years later, to me it's all about relationships. And I can look around the room and some of you are part of those relationships that I carry with me. And it's about discovering those ordinary points in time that come along the journey and celebrating them. So I believe that the most important thing families should remember that happens when a child with a disability is born is that a child is born. Do not lose sight of that, no matter what happens. I also know that as parents, we have common dreams that we can talk about. 
I think we all want our children to feel good about themselves and their circle of support. We want them to live in a community and be respected by the members of their neighborhood and that we want at some point for them to make a contribution to society. So whether we're a family in this room that has a child with a disability or cares about someone with a disability or just has children, I think we have that in common. But having a child with a disability is a significant life experience that challenges our very core values. There's no way of getting around that. We must remember that our work in life is about relationships. It's about building those incredible relationships. And so once again, I want you to remember that the most important thing that happens when people become parents of a child with a disability is that they become parents. So I am very privileged to be part of what is going to be created here at The Mind, a Family Navigator program. We are in the process right now of establishing this program, and we want to enhance in this program patient and family-centered care and shared decision-making for individuals with developmental disabilities. This is going to be a joint effort with the SED, which you all know is the Center for Excellence on Developmental Disabilities and the Child Life Program here at The Mind. So we are partnering both of those in order to get the results that we hope we can do to impact families. It's our belief in building this process that we will base it on family-centered care. And what is family-centered care? It is an understanding that the family is the child's primary source of strength it puts families at the heart and center of services grounded in collaboration. We want here to build authentic family and professional partnerships that will support a climate of responsiveness to the needs of children and to the families that come to the mind. Someone that I um, learned about on my way in early childhood education and advocacy was a person named Jerry Paul. And she reminds us that how you are is as important as what you do. So when we build our Family Navigator program, it is going to be about relationship-based work. It will support families to benefit their child. We will create opportunities for expertise to be effective. And we will remind them that the family is the actual unit of intervention. How we see families view their families, how they view us, and in the process, how they view their family is the greatest resource we can give them. We know there is chaos that comes in a diagnosis, but we will help them to remember the beauty of their child because they, the family, are the constant in the child's life. Because, and all of us together, we will know that our work is about building the authentic wonderfulness in their child. So I think everything I do, I try to find a little bit of a wow factor to kind of savor those words of wisdom that come to me from a lot of people in my circle of support. And what I think we know now is that we know that lives of families are forever changed with a diagnosis, whatever it is, whether it is autism or another neurodevelopmental disability. We hope that the Family Navigator program will help families become more confident and competent to support their child's development. And we plan to support them so that every day in their day-to-day -day ordinary lives, they will dwell in possibilities they will build relationships. They will build their own circles of support. They will work on solving their problems and locating the resources. We know that that is our work, and we are going to help families and support it as their work. So I believe, and I've believed this from the beginning, that our role as a family member is to provide opportunities for the kinds of children we have not for the kinds of children we used to have, which often comes when you get a diagnosis much later than I did with my daughter. Um, we knew from the beginning that we were in trouble and we were gonna have to build our world and change it in a, and make different goals. But we need to remember that we don't wanna want the kinds of children we used to have or wanted to have or the child that is in our dreams. We are on a new journey and so the Family Navigator, we've set up goals that we hope will maximize the family's capacity, 
their strengths and their unique abilities so that they can support, they can nurture, they can love, and they can facilitate opportunities within their family. We plan to provide comprehensive and compassionate care to children with disabilities. And we plan to support families to access health care in a systematic way so that we can help them be empowered in their decision making. As Aubin told you, there were so many decisions that come once a diagnosis happens. We plan to be there with the families to help them advocate and to offer the education support and guidance to help families cope with the challenges. There is a lot of work being done in the world of early childhood and early start, and many of you maybe already know this concept that the Department of Developmental Services and Education have really been embracing in the last few years, which is about strengthening families. It's the approach that people are taking because they're really factoring in that whole concept of social-emotional, social-emotional for the child, and then the social-emotional capacity of the family. And the work is based on five protective factors that people believe is what strengthens a family. The knowledge of parenting a child and child development, concrete support in time of need, building social connections, looking at the social and emotional competence of children, and then parent resilience. And I think parent resilience is one of the most important from my perspective. And I think it's something that we have to recommit to every day because it's those things in life that stop you cold and think, oh, I thought I had it all done. I've been through the middle of the diagnosis like Elizabeth talked to, but there's always some new challenge, whether you're five or 15 or 35. So in the Family Navigator program, we plan to build protective and promotive factors we don't want to just reduce the risk. It is an approach that we will use with families. It's not a model. It's not a program. It's not a curriculum. We want to create a change relationship with families, aligning them with best practices in the field and developmental science. We want them to come to us, and we want to ask them, tell us where they are in their world at that point. Not to ask them why, but tell me, and then we can build from there. Because it's my belief that nobody really listens to you until they feel that they've been heard themselves. Maya Angelou tells us that when you know better, you do better. So one of the factors of the Family Navigator will be the art of storytelling. We will help families build and cultivate that skill. Because when you go to the doctor or when you are with the interventionist or where you're whatever service provider, they need to know all about all of you, about your body, about your health, about your life, about your relationships. We plan to say something to the person behind the diagnosis. We won't be talking about to the diagnosis, but actually the child and the family. Because we know it's important to choose those words carefully, because our words are going to be remembered for a long time by that family. Elizabeth told us she remembers exactly how that day felt from beginning to end, and that is what most families could tell you as well. So we want to have the power to influence their attitude towards themselves, towards their children, and the lives they're building together, the new lives they're building as a family. One of the techniques we'll use is motivational interviewing, which is a more of a collaborative conversation style. So it will strengthen a person's own motivation and commitment um, to change. And it's a person-centered type of conversation style. And it's based on an attitude of acceptance and compassion. That's the environment that we're trying to build. One of the people in my circle of support told me this a long time ago. Just remember, Kathy, success is a journey, not a destination. And I am forever grateful that I hold that mantra in my head. Because what we know for sure is that you need family navigators to be with you. You need a dedicated guide on this journey. We want to help families feel safe. We want to fo focus on what matters most to them today, what matters to their family that day. And those will be the first steps that we take. And then we will take the next steps and the next steps. So it's more of a coaching model. And it will to build parent and families so that they are confident, they are competent, 
And most important to me is that they enjoy their child and they enjoy their family. So here's a picture of Megan at 35. And to me, this represents a meaningful life. When I look at this picture, she has, she has a little baking business called Sweet Inspirations. It's a social reciprocity one, so no money's exchanged, nothing has to do that. I buy the ingredients, she bakes, she delivers, and it, it works out really well, and her father always gets to sample everything that she makes. So her latest people that she discovered at the grocery store and we decided to build on were the firefighters in our neighborhood, and they were shopping for their dinner when Megan and I were shopping for family dinner at our house. And so we decided what a great idea. We could cook for the firefighters. So this is hope for me. This is what a meaningful life looks like. It is, it reminds me that Megan's interests and her strengths and her dreams and her gifts are more important than her disability. So I believe that attitude is everything in life and we do not navigate life alone. So now my co-partner in the Family Navigator, Erin, is going to share her words of wisdom. Good evening, my name is Erin Roseboro and I'm a child life specialist here at the Mind Institute. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's a hard act to follow, you guys. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but you're our closer. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I've been uh, working here at the Mind Institute 15 years um, and I never, working here, I never thought I'd have for one, seven children, which I have, and two, <laughs> that I would have a daughter who's nine with autism. Um, so my family, uh, we have a blended family, and we have four boys and three girls, one of which is our sunshine, she likes that to be called that, her brothers have to call her that too, um, <laughs> is, um, and she is nine, and I gave birth to three boys and have three stepchildren also. Um, she came to us at four years old um, and, <clears throat> sorry, um, we had lost her mother to congestive heart failure. So her mom was actually sick. She was diagnosed um, with postpartum cardiomyopathy six weeks after birth. Um, so she was pretty much sick her whole time of knowing her mom. So grandma and mom lived together and they helped raise her. So grandma was just as much of a mom as mom was. So we lost her um, when she had just turned four. And then that following spring, we lost my mother-in-law. <laughs> so um, we lost the two people that she knew the most in her life. But luckily, we lived a block away and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law had a daycare center and so we saw them every day so she doesn't know anything other than her cousins as basically her siblings so that transition into our life was very simple um, and very easy for everybody to get together <clears throat> at the beginning uh, my situation is a little bit different because <clears throat> due to all the trauma in her life it was really hard to um, decipher what behaviors were because we had just lost everything that she had or what behaviors were something that seemed out of the ordinary. So we, um, <clears throat> we started kindergarten and we had a rough start, always underneath the tables, always meltdowns the whole time. But she's a quiet, shy little one, very sneaky, loves craft supplies, so she would always sneak in the back and take all the glue and, and get into everything. So some of the things that were, you know, were not obvious at the beginning. But after kindergarten, we started to notice that she was an understanding friendships in her classroom, and those other behaviors kept on increasing also. Thank you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, so then, in first grade, the teacher and the school, we decided to have her assessed, and they recommended that we have her um, assessed at the school, and then also here at the Mind Institute, which I was so lucky that I was already here. So um, it's so different, though, coming to work every day and hearing all the diagnosis, and I run the volunteer program, working with hundreds and thousands of different families 
that, um, that I would be sitting in that same room with the same psychologists and doctors that I know and going through the process with her. Um, so we had a diagnosis when she was in first grade and um, she's always been a little bit tricky because she falls in so many different areas and her behavior is more ADHD and so we have all these other components with her diagnosis also. Um, in school, um, let me see, we, I wanted to just talk about a few of the areas that we had the most, that I saw that were kind of some of our challenges with her, after her diagnosis. Um, because I was lucky that I could go knock on everyone's door and say, what does this line in my report read, or what is this, and what is the school saying? Um, I could go to the resource center where everyone that had already gone through an IEP could help coach me through those pieces of the IEP. So the IEP, since she was um, in first grade, was our first hurdle, never been to one. Um, I walk into the room and I was, didn't know what to expect, so I saw all these people at the table. There was a lot more people than I thought. And then the teacher <laughs> weeks over at me and she's like, well, the head of the school district is here. He's never been here and the, this, uh, this other person is here and he never is at a meeting. So I was, I was very, I was even more scared of what we were gonna have to face. But it went very well and um, I ended up getting everything that I wanted and she has a full-time aide in her classroom, speech, OT. Um, she gets pulled out for learning center for math and reading and she's fully included in her classroom. Um, one thing though, in our first IEP, um, I had a, already a relationship with our principal because I do have three boys, so we were, <laughs> I, I know him very well. <laughs> um, and so I had already, I'd known him, and so in the meeting, my request was that I wanted to retain her, and because she was having such a hard time in first grade, was not meeting any, any grade level, expectation so we um, so we had a big discussion and pretty much a big argument about retaining a child and um, his whole thing was research shows that you know if you retain your child they're gonna have you know um, resent you and gonna not have their friends when they graduate and and I just kind of said in his face, I was like, but research is for typical children. And this, she doesn't have a friend in her classroom and she doesn't care about those things. And um, I was so glad that I stepped forward that day and made that decision because it was the best decision um, that we made for her at the time. And it's hard because she is my child now, but there's certain things that just, you know, I think I questioned myself more than I would if it was my very, very own child, but even though we, um, she is our daughter. Um, so with that decision of retaining her, it um, built her self-esteem. She was able actually to connect with that age group of children better. She felt confident coming back into first grade because she knew where her name tag was. We had the most amazing teacher who had her accept her back into her classroom. So we actually could pinpoint growth in her development also. So it ended up working out very well. Um, my next slide is my three boys <laughs> and, um, and our daughter. And so 10 years that I've, part of 10 years that I've been here, I've been working on our social skills program and running a sibling support program. And so, Lo and behold, now I'm helping them, coaching them through things with her. Um, siblings are the people we practice on, the people who teach us about fairness, cooperation, kindness, and um, caring quite often the hard way, said Pamela Duggell. <clears throat> so um, I know a new diagnosis is so impactful on the parents but it is a great impact on the family in itself. It could be cousins, grandparents, um, but mainly the siblings. And I learned so much working with all the kids that I've worked with um, in all of my sibling groups. Um, we used to have a feeling of the day, and one time it was about, <clears throat> we would just start the day with a feeling, and we'd let them pick it, and so once it was worried, 
And we talked about worried, what they're worried about for 45 minutes. And it was ages um, 6 to 13 at that time was that group. <clears throat> and it was just really amazing of the things they were already concerned about at these ages. What happens when, you know, my parents are not with us anymore? Or what happens at the next stages? So those are things that these kids are already thinking about. <clears throat> my son a few weeks ago, wasn't a week ago, a few months ago, was um, saying, oh, mom, oh, don't worry, when I get my house, Brooklyn's house is gonna be right next to mine. And, um, and so just like always thinking of that mentality, they're very coddling of her. And actually one point I wanted to say, um, when I retained her, um, my one son is nine also. So they are in the same grade level, which was fine because he's actually very coddling and tries to follow her on the playground and take care of her. So it was actually nice that they have a separate recess now. He has fourth grade and she has third grade now. And so that was a great, um, a great separation for those two too. Um, and <clears throat> some of the stresses that we worry about for kids um, going with siblings um, with autism or another disability is sometimes they just feel the embarrassment for their peers, but it's not the embarrassment that they feel, it's they don't know how to tell their friends or they don't know how to explain the behavior that their brother or sister is having. So helping your kids just talk to other kids, it's not that they're embarrassed, it's just that they want to explain it to somebody. <clears throat> also, um, <clears throat> jealousy, that was another feeling that we d talked about in our group. Um, I, the only time I really ever see them jealous of them is every morning I walk her to her classroom because if we don't walk from the line to the desk, we end up in the field <laughs> or something. Um, <clears throat> so my littlest one, every morning, he, um, that's the only thing he ever really complains about is he's like, Mom, walk me to my class today. So, but we kind of explain to him and if dad comes, then he'll walk into class. But, um, or if she goes to computers, I get to go on that day. But, um, but the jealousy that they have isn't really jealousy, it's just attention. And, and it's not that we're doing bad as a parent not giving them that appropriate attention, but <clears throat> it's just part of every sibling. It's not even that they just have a, you know, a disability or autism. Um, you would have a, the same situation in any family. Um, one thing that I try to do with my kids is, I work full time here, so, um, and having all of them, is I try to attend all their field trips so that I can go individually with them. That's kind of my date with them. So anytime they have a field trip come up, except my 11 year old now, he, I'm not cool enough to go on field trips anymore. <laughs> That's not our, <laughs> we have other times, I guess. <laughs> um, but that's a moment where I can just say, I don't have a night that I can just take them out to dinner or, you know, sometimes I'll take one to like a basketball practice, but just making that individualized time and just going on those field trips has been my, my, my piece in time with them. So a little bit, um, I'm a child life specialist and a lot of people um, do not know what child life is unless you have a child in the hospital. Um, so, a child life specialist is a professional who works in an inpatient um, pediatric setting or an outpatient clinic, radiology, emergency room. Um, we're in dentist's office now. And then I was one of the, I was the first one in the outpatient clinic here at the Mind Institute. Um, we work on helping uh, infants, children, and youth help cope with the stress of hospitalization or just the environment of the stressful situation that they're in. <clears throat> so here, my goal as a child life specialist has been really to help educate staff, nurses, OR staff, ER staff, other child life specialists in the other areas of the hospital to help children with autism when they're in the hospital. Um, I have families that have told me, you know, emailed me, um, I'm in the hospital right now and they're not listening to any of my needs. Um, and it was a simple need that her daughter wanted everybody to just, instead of showing their badge, say their name when they entered her room. 
That's all she was asking, and nobody was answering. You know, they just thought that was kind of a out of line thing for everybody to do. Um, so those are from the families that I've been meeting about their hospital stays and with working with Kathy with the Family Navigator, we've talked to um, many families that are have experienced hospital, hospitalizations or had different things, or we wanted to know also about the diagnosis process, but trying to help in the community of those areas where the gap is. So my mission here at The Mind was, um, has changed a little bit since I have um, have my niece, um, is now I'm trying to work on family-centered care programs. Um, and this summer, we, myself and Caitlin Jensen, another child life specialist, we had four summer camps. And I started the summer camps because I was looking for a camp for my daughter, and I couldn't afford them, and I didn't want her to go overnight somewhere because I knew I, she would not do that because um, she never leaves my side. <laughs> um, so what we did was we started summer camps here at the Mind Institute. And so we have a playground, we have outside. We, so we were able to take 45 families this summer, and we had various age groups, and we started a social recreational summer camp. Um, and it was a great success. Um, we learned a lot, and um, we're still learning. Um, but all the families' feedback was really positive. Um, so that's one example that I've been able to take from my own family situation. Then from the summer camps, all the families stayed at summer camp, because some were from far away, and would congregate in the lobby and talk to each other as a support group during camp, and even had um, one group even formulated and had a barbecue that Saturday, like a pool party of all the kids from camp, because they had gotten so close at camp. So they were saying how they really enjoyed the time of meeting other families. So we've now started family time at the mind, and our first one will be October 13th, which we had 200 seats and now we're full, but um, we will have a magic show and we're gonna have trick-or-treating. And it's funny, because every parent that's called I said, oh, we've never done trick-or-treating because it's dark, there's masks, so we're having, we're gonna try <laughs> and have trick-or-treating. So we're gonna, you know, we will learn from this experience, but I'm sure it will be great. Um, I've also helped out with the research thank you party, which is a large event that we have for all of our research families. Um, we started off with 300 people attending and now we're at 1,200, um, and that's a day where we try to just create a very safe, sensory kind environment for our families. Also, we'd like to also continue, and my um, love is continuing also with the sibling support um, groups, because I feel like the siblings are these, they're very unique children that when you have a, um, when they grow up with a child with special needs or autism, um, they have a very, they're very empathetic, they understand things, they're sometimes more grown than their age, but um, I think they're going to be some great people in the world. So, um, and then the Family Navigator Program, which Kathy has told you all about, um, is also a piece that <clears throat> we've kind of seen that is very needed in our clinic after you get a diagnosis, you do get your appointment with your clinician and you go over the report, but I think you're in shock. You don't know all of these things. And then you're given a list, um, I think mine was six pages, of <clears throat> all the different therapies and all different things. Um, and it's just like, okay, here's where I start. So um, the Family Navigator is just hopefully going to hold that family's hand for a moment and just see where they're at and um, see the needs that um, <clears throat> they need at that time. Um, so we'll be working on that in the future. And then um, Aubin talked about organization, and this is something that the Family Navigator is going to help with also. Um, this is already established actually through Children's um, Hospital. So if you went to UC Davis Children's Hospital website, there is um, you can download all of this in their section. So that's been one thing is um, <clears throat> my care binder that I have for my daughter. 
I take everywhere, and, and she said, you, you like feel confident? You do. You feel very organized with this big binder of all these papers, and you feel it just, it does make you feel confident, <laughs> and you can just go to the next page. So um, I take it to doctor's appointments. Um, one thing my daughter has had is, um, you know, we had the list of like ABA, but I've never checked that off yet. I have to say I feel guilty all the time that I haven't even looked into it yet. But she had a lot of medical issues, so I had nine doctor's appointments after one doctor appointment to go to other specialty clinics. So I just keep a running list and that eight doctor appointments has taken me a year and a half to get through because nothing was an emergency, but it was check this to check this to check that. And um, so we finally got through the eight. So ABA and some other programs are on my list still. Um, but every time I meet with a developmental pediatrician, she kind of brings me back on track and, oh, try this next time, try this next time. Um, and honestly, every time I go back to her, I've only gone to one thing, so that list just keeps on getting longer. Um, but this binder and things like this, <clears throat> some people are in a paper people, and if you have, there's different forms of binders online also, but very helpful for your providers. <clears throat> there's just a few resources. Um, I wasn't sure in the audience exactly, you know, who everyone would be, but one um, great resource I've used to help train other and do other presentations is Prescription for Excess. It's written by a child life specialist. Her name is Jill Hudson, and it's a really nice book with a lot of things you can photocopy and good ideas for helping people in the medical field help with children with autism. And it's just a great book. They have it actually on Davis Tower 7 in the hospital to help nurses understand also. Um, and then another book that Elizabeth recommended is You're Going to Love This Kid. Um, and it's a great book that she explained um, if you're meeting with your, your teacher and helping um, explain things from, I guess, different ideas and helpful tasks or different lists and things you can copy and different creative ideas for the classroom. Um, that was one challenge that I learned just this year was we went from second grade to third grade and when we went first grade to second grade, transition was very smooth and great and I didn't have any problems but this year was really rough and um, one thing that I know next year is I'm going to keep all of her papers and all of her materials of what we where we were at the last day of school and then show that new teacher the next time and also just helping teacher meeting with the teacher Elizabeth had suggested meeting with the teacher before school starts and having a meeting and that would have been really helpful too um, so I'm always around so many different people that give me a lot of great suggestions and um, and I think that's it <laughs> Thank you. So the question was, what gives um, us individually the greatest hope for families? Um, and I would say, uh, personally, uh, like I said in the presentation, um, for me, uh, getting connected to community made a huge difference. Um, because when I realized that it wasn't uh, even though my experience felt very isolating, I was not alone. Um, it really gave me a lot of comfort. Um, and so once I got more connected with uh, families who have uh, been down the path that I was going um, and got a chance to really get to know them, get to know their family, that gave me a lot of hope in so many ways uh, because I and I, I could see that it was something that, you know, once again, I wasn't in it by myself, but then also that I had some uh, frame of reference to go to when it came to, uh, you know, knowing some options um, for that w my family could potentially take. I guess I can give the provider perspective on what gives me hope, and we do a lot of training in the community for, um, people who work with families and the dedication and willingness to go the extra mile um, of, I would say, 
there's always that one, um, of people I work with and they're really reaching out for information and training and um, understanding how to have family-centered care, as you guys are talking about. I think that's a new direction for our field and it gives me just wonderful hope for the support we can provide. I think what gives me hope is that in when Megan was little, we were really in that category called pioneers for inclusion. We were the ones that were creating the programs, advocating with the school districts, trying to say that children belong together, that that's how children will learn better, that you know it's all about a normal childhood, that you want those opportunities. And now I think that lots of families are offered that and community supported and I look at some of the children that were um, classmates of Megan's in elementary school, in youth group, in high school, and that, and where they are in their 30s and the career choices they made. And I just think it's all that essence of reciprocity that makes me really hopeful that we learned from each other and we did better by doing that. And my hope is um, <clears throat> more education. I think the more the community is educated, there's a program called the A Touch of Understanding that goes to elementary schools and helps them explain just what some different disabilities are. And just things like that, I feel like makes the whole community more accepting. Um, and then also just to parents that find other parents, they're gonna be your key to everything. Um, you might not be down the same path as them, but um, I know that I've gotten so much information just from people coaching me through different situations. Are there any resources for the child with ASD to help them understand their diagnosis or just what's going on? Um, I know some of the, so for us, and I think one of the things we talk about a lot in the support group that I help facilitate um, is that families will ask the questions, um, and we've, we've talked about, um, you know, when do you talk to your child about autism? And if you decide to talk to your child about autism, um, and when you do, um, how do, how do you present it? And I think that uh, when we talk about it, you know, one of the, the key things is to make sure that you are always framing it in a very um, asset-based type of framework, not a deficit-based. Um, and so some of that means that the parent themselves has to really get their head around um, the diagnosis and uh, when they're thinking about the disability also not take that framework too. Um, it, and so because you can project that on your child. Um, so one of the things I know we have uh, talked about and one of my, my friends and colleagues, she talks about when she uh, talked to her son about autism, how they've used books. There's lots of uh, child-friendly picture books um, that are out there to describe um, the experience, and experience of a child on the spectrum. Um, there's also some really great videos in, in films uh, that have can be found um, to, that can be very helpful. Um, and for older kids, uh, reading a, a autobiography of a self-advocate, uh, a person who's on the autism spectrum, it can be very empowering. Um, uh, going to a training of a self-advocate. We have an amazing uh, community of self-advocates, um, the Autism Self-Advocacy uh, Network uh, that is a national uh, self-advocacy organization um, that for older children, it can be very helpful for them to be a part of that. Um, some close friends of mine uh, that talk, uh, they have a, a child that is a public speaker himself uh, that talks about acceptance and autism awareness. Um, so I, I really feel like there's, there's quite a few resources out there. It's going to be really on you being the expert of your child and being in relationship with your child to know what would be the best fit. So how to be able to present that information in a way that will be meaningful for them um, will really be individualized. Okay, the next question. Um, I have, what are the ways that I can make connections within the autism community, such as uh, online or in person, local, national, um, et cetera? Um, does anyone? It's okay, I'll answer that too. 
<laughs> so what I found. Um, so a, a, a great way to uh, make connection would, to, would really to look for, um, if you're a parent, any types of parent support groups that are, are available. Um, there are a variety of parent support groups that we have um, here at The Mind and that are held at The Mind, but then also that we're in connection with. Um, so you can go to our Family Resource Center and receive that information. We actually have quite a few of the flyers out on, uh, right, right in the lobby uh, that Terry has put out. Um, so that's a great way um, to be able to get connected if you're a parent once again, if you are a, a, a person with autism, um, then you, we, we do have the self-advocacy organizations um, that are out there um, that can be very helpful. Um, and then online presence, that, that's tricky um, because you, sometimes you don't want to get affiliated with certain <laughs> online presence, right? Um, but you know, there, there's actually some really strong uh, groups on social media that you can connect with um, that can be really helpful. Um, and most of the time the way that I found out, I found out about those was being connected to a parent support group um, that had that connection to some of those online entities. So um, there's a variety of ways, um, but uh, you know it does take effort. Okay, I'm gonna do the next question because of time. The question is how do you as parents plan for post-school issues like jobs and vocational pieces? So. Once again, I will plug that we have a really good transition program here at The Mind, and Think Transition puts on different workshops during the year that, that will be really beneficial to opening your eyes to what the options might be. Also, um, the Warm Line Family Resource Center does a lot of work on with um, people that are in high school and above now getting ready for that world of work. So I think those are some starting points as well as looking at, you know, in the education system, there should be a lot of work with those transition IEPs where you can get information. Um, I think using the ROP programs, work, workability programs at the school, um, coming to the, most school districts now have transition fairs and then Warmline hosted a transition fair last week and it's just that networking and once again, I'll plug the Family Resource Center here in terms of having information for you on that as well. Do you have another question? Um, yes. <clears throat> this question is, um, how can we sign up for the summer camp program and the family time at the Mind? Um, so. We've, um, we're doing it by uh, trial and error because um, we're not really sure yet how to promote these activities. Um, we posted one post on Facebook and we filled up within five days for the family time at the mine. So we will continue. We would like to have four family times at the mine um, a year and we'll always post them a few months ahead of time on our events page, it'll be posted on Facebook, um, and it was a first come, first serve basis. Um, also with summer camp was the same way we um, will post and fill out, have families fill out applications, um, and then we had, it was first come, first serve basis for that. We were, all, we were actually able to accommodate all the families, though, that signed up at that time. Um, okay. Just... It, that was on Facebook and our events page, and also in the clinics. Um, yeah, so this time we'll probably start in February. Probably February we'll have the dates and start posting at that time. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.